Will you take the wonderful word of God tonight and open to 2 Timothy chapter 6. 2 Timothy chapter 6. In just a few minutes, we're going to be looking specifically at verses 6 through 10. 2 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas. I hope this is a time filled with joy for you and your family. And I hope that you'll be mindful of those that may not have family in our area, some that may be spending Christmas by themselves, and perhaps you can give them a call, stop by for a visit, check on them, let them know that they are not forgotten during this holiday season. Tammy and I will be close by this coming week. Uh, in fact, uh, we're just going for a little day trip for Christmas over to our uh, family, our daughters and our son over in Memphis, the Memphis area. Then we'll be coming right back. So uh, we'll be here on Wednesday night. There will be a devotional Wednesday night in the chapel. Realize many people will be gone, but some may want to avail yourselves of that opportunity. And I'll be here to coordinate that on Wednesday night. And likewise, I'll be here next Sunday, speaking Sunday morning, and then I'll be speaking next Sunday night at the college church. So even though we won't have services here, you'll still hear me preach next Sunday night. Oh, joy. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that just really made your day, well, didn't it? But I, I always like, it's our time to conduct the services, and we do that about every five years there, and so we're always glad to do it. Several of our men, Brandon Grady, Dennis Fant, Matthew Brooks, going to be leading singing and several of our men leading in prayer. So we're looking forward to that next Sunday night. And that will begin, by the way, at 5 o'clock, the same time we start here, but it will simply be at the college church building. And then on Monday the 30th, Tammy and I are going to be leaving town for a week to drive to North Carolina to visit with uh, family members there, including our daughter and her family. So. Um, that will, that, that's what we're doing. And I know you're doing some wonderful activities as well. There used to be a singer back in the 1950s and 60s genre of time named Peggy Lee. Now, if any of you are familiar with the Walt Disney animated feature, Lady in the Tramp, Peggy Lee is the one who sang the song about the tramp. So she had a rather familiar voice during that period of time. But there in the late 60s, she sang a song that was entitled, Is That All There Is? And she talked about various stages of life. For instance, she talked about being a child and going to the circus and how much anticipation there had been to go to the circus. And yet after the circus, with its clowns and its animals and its uh, aerobatic acts was through, she simply said to herself, is that all there is to a circus? And then she talked about how one night her house burned. Her family stood on the sidewalk and watched as a lifetime full of memories crumbled into a pile of ashes. And then after the fire had been extinguished, she said to herself, is that all there is to a fire? And then she grew up and became a young lady and she fell in love. But after she had been forsaken, she said to herself, is that all there is to love? Well, I guess if there is any song that might sum up the feelings that a lot of people have on Christmas night, it might be that song. After all of the gifts have been unwrapped and all of the festivities have concluded, all of the meals have been eaten, it's very tempting for people to say, is that all there is? Is that all there is? And if you don't believe that, let me ask you a question. What did you get for Christmas last year? or the year before, or the year before that. You see, after all of the hype of the holidays has concluded, we're left asking the question, 
Is that all there is? A lot of people go through their lives that way. Now I want you to notice what, T what Paul wrote to Timothy, his young evangelist friend whom he'd left in Ephesus for the purpose of teaching them how to conduct themselves within the church, the household of faith, the family of God, the pillar of the truth, 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. But notice what he says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. He says, but godliness is great gain when accompanied by contentment. Let me repeat that one. Godliness is great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we shall take nothing out of it either. For those who long to become rich fall into temptations and snares and dangerous and foolish behaviors which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, which some, longing for it, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I think it's very tempting for us in our materialistic modern world to become consumed by our possessions. And yet at the end of all of those possessions, there is still that gnawing emptiness as we ask ourselves, is that all there is? So tonight, I have three considerations for us as we consider God's guide to great gain. God's guide to great gain. And the first of these considerations is we need to be aware of the pitfalls of riches. There are pitfalls to riches. Now, a lot of people think if I just had wealth, all of my problems in life would be solved. If I just had wealth, I could pay off all of my bills. I could put money in the bank. I could buy the things that I want. I could give things that I want to people that I want to give them to. If I just had a lot of wealth, then all of my problems would be solved. And I want to tell you tonight, that simply is not true. Because there are pitfalls to wealth. I want to tell you three of them. First of all, the more you have, the more it costs. The more you have, the more it costs. The more things you have, you have to maintain them. You have to keep them up. Over in Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 15, Jesus says that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. And then he tells a parable about a farmer who said to himself, after he had had a great crop, he said, I will tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Now notice this. Here is a man, he's had, he's had an accumulation of wealth, but what does he do? He says, I want more. So I'm going to tear down what I've got, and I'm just going to build something bigger. Well, what does that mean? If you build something bigger, there's going to be more cost involved. There's going to be more upkeep involved. There, there's going to be more expense involved and effort involved in maintaining that. And the more that you have, the greater your costs are going to be. You're going to have to pay people to maintain that. You're going to have to pay uh, parts and labor and all of these different things. I'm just saying it's not all that you think it's going to be. You might think that if you had a windfall, that if suddenly you had great riches and great wealth, that everything would be wonderful in your life, don't buy it. Don't buy that because 
the more you have, the more expensive it becomes. Number two, the more you have, the more you worry about. Exactly. I was telling Tammy on the way over here tonight, I said, <clears throat> with regard to this point, you know, I am so thankful I don't have to worry about our beachfront property when a hurricane comes. I am so thankful that I don't have to worry about our beachfront house. You know the one up on the stilts? Whenever a hurricane blows ashore, you know why I don't have to worry about it? I don't have it. <laughs> I don't own it. I don't have one. And we love to spend our summers out on the, on the coast sometimes. I go out and spend a week or so, but we just rent. I don't own. I just, we just go out and rent a house. Let somebody else worry with all of that. The more you have, the more worry there is to it. Solomon attests to that back in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says the more that he had, the more it became a drain upon his life. The more that it consumed his mental abilities and the more that it cost him to maintain those things. So don't think merely by having more that you're going to have less worry. And number three, the more you have, the more time it's going to require from you. Some people think, well, if I just had more, then I would have more time on my hands. Good friend of mine, dear friend of mine, down in West Helena some years ago, wanted to buy a house outside of town. He longed for the day when he could get out of town, and he wanted to buy a house that had about five or ten acres with it. And he saved and scrimped. He was in the dry cleaning business. And I mean, he worked in that business and saved his money. Excellent manager of money. But finally, he bought that house just outside of town. He had about five or ten acres with it. Beautiful house, beautiful acreage, property. I saw, you know, when I, about a year or two later, I guess maybe three, I said, Ernie, how are you liking your place? He said, it's about to kill me. He said, all I do is cut grass. He said, I mow yard from the time I get home in the afternoon until it gets dark. And then I've got to weed eat. And then when I'm done, it's time to start all over again. Within two more years, he had sold that place, moved back into town in a house that had no yard. Now, folks, that is, that is just a classic example of what I'm talking about. The more you have, the more time it's going to require of you. There are people today who have tremendously nice houses, and they have beautiful yards. They may even have tennis courts or swimming pools that never get used because they're always at work paying for it. And those are some of the pitfalls. But Satan makes all of this seem so attractive to us. And he makes us think that if we can just somehow get ahead, and if somehow we can accumulate enough stuff that we will one day be happy. You ever known someone who said, I'd be happy if only I had that new house? Or I'd be happy if only I had that new car? Or I'd be happy if only, if only, if only. You know, the Bible says that happiness is a matter of choice. It's not a matter of circumstance. Proverbs 23, verse 7, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 4, 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for from it springs the issues of life. Happiness, real joy, 
is not contingent upon circumstances. It's something that comes from within a person's heart, not their pocketbook. Now, number two, those are some of the pitfalls. But secondly, let's look at some priorities. Scripture says that there are some priorities that we must follow if we want godliness with great gain. And the first of these is we are not to compare ourselves with other people. So often people do that. The end of the Gospel of John, Jesus is speaking to Peter <clears throat> there in John chapter 20, or chapter 21, excuse me. And there uh, Peter looks to John and he says, what about this man, Lord? <laughs> Jesus has been telling Peter that his, his life is not going to be easy. And he looks at John and he says, what about this man? And Jesus says, don't worry about that. You just, you take care of, you've got your life. Don't be worried about that other, that other person's. What happens when we start comparing ourselves with other people? You noticed? So often, we compare our worst with their best. And so often when we think about this world's goods and we see what other people have, we begin wanting those things. I was in a doctor's office a while back and I saw a magazine entitled Better Homes and Gardens. Are you familiar with that publication? I just picked it up and started uh, thumbing through it and looking at those pictures of new houses and construction and furniture and kitchen cabinetry and flooring. And the more I looked at it, the more I thought, I live in a dump. You know what I'm saying? No, I don't live in a dump. I mean, I, we've, we've got, we've got a, a, a nice place. But the more I compared what I had with what I was seeing in this magazine and all of these glossy, retouched photographs, the more I felt insignificant and deprived. And finally, I just closed it and laid it back down. I thought, I'm not going to look at this stuff. I feel I'm feeling bad about myself. And yet, don't we all do that? We go to somebody's house, oh, I wish I had that TV instead of the one I've got. I wish I had their car instead of the one I've got. I, I wish I had that table, dining room table, instead of the one I've got. And it just goes on and on and on. And we even do it at church. I wish I had what they're wearing. I, I, I wish I had their money. I wish I had their house. And in the process, we make ourselves perfectly miserable. Philippians chapter 4. Listen to Paul, beginning in verse 11. He said, I have learned the secret of being content. I know how to be full, and I know how to be empty. I know what it means to be in need, and I know what it means to abound. I have learned the secret of being content in all circumstances. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul. Here was a man who had grown up in Tarsus in a home where he received the best education possible. He had known the heights of status within the Jewish religion. And yet, he had known the depths of poverty and the depths of discouragement. 
He had been put in prison. He had been beaten. He'd been left for dead. Paul had experienced all of this, and he said, I have learned how to be content in every circumstance. And I think one of the way Paul, ways Paul could do that was he did not go around, go around comparing himself to other people. God has made you unique. And he has blessed you and gifted you with talents, abilities, and gifts that are uniquely yours. Do not go around demeaning yourself and degrading yourself because you do not have what someone else may have. Stop comparing yourself to others. Number two, in terms of priority, enjoy what you have. There is not a one of us in this room tonight that is not blessed with an abundance. Not one of us who is not blessed with abundance. Many of you have traveled to third world countries and you know of what I'm speaking. The first time I made a trip to the West Indies to preach, I went to the island of St. Vincent, located just north of the island of Grenada. If you're probably a little familiar, more familiar with Grenada than you would be St. Vincent. But St. Vincent and the Grenadines, a small chain of islands located in the southern part of the West Indies. I'd never seen poverty as I saw it there. But I remember one incident as I was driving one day down a windy, mountainous road out to a little community called Bayabu, where I was preaching that night, I saw three or four kids. They looked to be about seven or eight years old. And somehow they had found a rim of a bicycle, just one rim, tire rim, of a bicycle. And they were pushing it down the road with a stick. And I'm telling you, those kids were laughing and giggling and having the time of their life with an old junk piece of a bicycle and a stick. And I thought to myself at the time, Back in Arkansas, my kids have a whole room full of toys. And every time a television commercial comes on, they say, I want that. And I realize just how materialistic I had become. When I arrived at my preaching appointment, there were a group of young adults there, in fact, teenagers, and we began talking, and one of, the, one of the young ladies asked me a question. She said, where are, you, where are you staying? I said, I'm staying in the Haddon Hotel. She said, where's that? I said, it's in Kingstown. She said, I've never been to Kingstown. Kingstown was only about 10 miles away. Here she was, a teenager, had never been 10 miles from her home. Enjoy what you have. The most enjoyable things in your life are the things that do not cost money. I enjoy seeing the sunrise. Though my eye condition deteriorates, I am thankful that I am still able 
so much of it is contingent upon light, good lighting. But in the mornings and in the evenings, I still have the ability to see the contrast and the color of a sunrise and a sunset. And it doesn't cost me a penny. I'm thankful that when I get up in the morning, first of all, I can get up. And I'm thankful when I take a shower, I have hot water. Do you know how many people in this world don't even have a clean source of water, much less hot? And every morning as I take that shower, I think to myself, God, thank you for letting me have hot water on a cold morning. Enjoy the things that you have. Priorities. Put people in their place. God did not create you for material things. God created you for relationship. He created you, first of all, for a relationship with Him. And secondly, He created you for a relationship with other human beings, with people. And we either serve people and possess things, or we're possessed by things and we do not serve people as we should. Keep people in their proper place. And always remember first things first. Jesus, in speaking to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, reminded them in Matthew 6 about the things of life that our necessities. He says, what do you worry about what you eat? Consider the birds of the air. They do not sow or gather, store into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more? And why do you worry about what you're going to wear? Consider the lilies of the field. Not even Solomon in all of his splendor was arrayed like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not also clothe you, O you of little faith? And then in verse 33, he concludes by saying, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Priorities. And then the third and last part of this, not only consider the pitfalls, consider the priorities, but consider the perspective. Everything of a material nature that we often long for and covet is merely temporary. Everything of a material nature is simply temporary. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes there at the end of the chapter, he says, let us look upon the things that are unseen, for whatever is seen is temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, we know that if this earthly tabernacle in which we dwell be destroyed, we have a building from God eternal in the heavens. All of these things that we clamor about so much in life pursuing, the new houses, the new cars, the, the, the nice clothing, the new toys, the new electronics, the new computers, the new gadgets, there is nothing wrong with any of these things, my dear friends. 
But these things that we allow to consume our lives, every one of them will end up being destroyed. Not a one of them is eternal. And as Paul says, back in 2 Timothy chapter 6, it is certain we brought nothing into this world and we shall take nothing out of it. That which is spiritual is that which is eternal. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 24, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be, also Jesus would say. As I conclude tonight, I want to tell you a story I heard a long time ago about a man who lived in a house on top of a mountain. It was a nice house. He built it himself, put many hours of sweat equity into it. He spent a lot of money on it. It was a beautiful house, log cabin, rustic house, stone fireplace, Beautiful front porch overlooking a gorgeous valley. But one day as he sat on his porch under a beautiful sky overlooking the green valley below, he noticed off in the distance a new house being built on a neighboring hillside. And as he watched day after day as that house was being constructed, finally one day something caught his attention. That new house had golden windows. He thought to himself, a house with golden windows? I can only imagine how opulent it must be, how luxurious it must be, a house with golden windows. And he determined that he had to see this house. It was a long way down the mountain and through a valley across uh, a very dangerous river running with rapids and back up the other hillside, the other mountain to where the other house had been constructed. But he determined that he was going to make the effort to go on this long journey so that he could see the house that had the golden windows. And so he set out one day, it took him several days just to reach the bottom of his mountain and then to cross that river at great peril and then to climb the other mountain. And when he got on top of the other mountain and came to the other house, he found out it was an ordinary, regular house. Nothing special or elaborate about it. And it had regular windows, just like his. But in the early morning sun, as he turned and looked back towards his house on the opposite hill, as the sun caught the, as the windows of his house caught the rays of the early sun, he noticed that it was his own house that had the golden windows. He had left in pursuit of something that he already had in his possession. I think there are a lot of people like that in our culture today who are pursuing things they think will make them happy if only they could enjoy what God has already given them. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. I hope you get good stuff. I know what I've asked for. I hope I get it. Am I getting it? But folks, let's keep it all in proper perspective. And let's remember that our lives do not consist in the abundance of things we possess. Tonight, if you need to come to the Lord, if your priorities have become flawed and you need to get them reestablished, realigned, come to Christ. If you need to become a Christian, please don't tarry. Do so tonight while we stand and sing.